You know, for the first part of these meetings, we have deliberately been trying to share with everyone the common beliefs that Seventh-day Adventists would have with all Christians. And this one tonight is one of the biggest, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Last night we noticed the fallen condition of man, which is a common belief of all evangelical Christians. The fallen condition of man, which is followed by the atonement, Christ died for our sins. But before we get into it, let's resurrect one more oldie. And uh, I'm surprised how many of you people know these. Evidently, you never forgot them since you put them in the bottom shelf or at the bottom of the piano bench. This one. I heard a group from a Nazarene college sing in Nashville not long ago, and they did such a beautiful job. It brought back memories when I used to sing it when I was a kid. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my stay from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. How many of you have heard it? You know it. Oh, look at look at you. I probably didn't notice that it's in one of the modern songbooks somewhere. But it's a beauty. Let's try it. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my stay from day to day, without him I would fall, when I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. That's good, but uh, the parts are missing, and you could just hear them about to break, you know, all of you altos and tenors. Uh, let's try the chorus and see if it doesn't break during this chorus here. Uh, what is the chorus? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sure there's a chorus somewhere. We're going to have to start at the beginning. Oh, it's when I'm sad to him I go. All right. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Oh, it was there. That was good. Thank you. Has the uh, cross ever gotten old hat to you? Have you ever seen so many pictures of the traditional type? Or have you ever sung about it so many times that it uh, got to be sort of a routine, a form thing that you go through or you look at? All this is the same. And you become gospel-hardened to the story or the picture or the song about the cross. It's easy to happen. And it has happened to me. That's why I was surprised to be startled out of my stereotype one day. It happened like this. Twenty years ago, I went on a trip with my brother to the Holy Land. We were with a tour group of 20 people. And on this tour group, uh, we had understood it was uh, for those who were interested in the scenes of Jesus' life. We didn't realize that it was going to have such a heavy archaeological flavor to it. And it wasn't long, and we discovered that we were visiting all of the digs and watching the people dig, you know, with their toothbrushes and tweezers. If you've never seen an archaeological dig, it is something else. 
every pebble and every grain of sand gets taken off with the tweezers, you know. And uh, we got to studying pot handles, pot handles from such and such an age and era and so forth. Um, I used to have a little interest in archaeology, but that trip killed it completely. <laughs> and one of the things that killed it was that one day we were passing across the road in Galilee, looking up toward a hillside, and there was a little village nestled against the hillside. And uh, I said, what village is that? That's the village of Nain. Nain, where the widow's son was raised from the dead. Yes. We're going. No. We have to hurry on to another dig to look at some more pot handles. And I just about threw my shoe through the window of the bus that time. Well, not too long ago, after these 20 years had gone by, I found myself sitting on a committee, a biblical research committee, where papers were being presented, scholarly papers about different things. And the next paper up was uh, a paper presented by an archaeologist, the archaeologist that had led our tour. And I braced my feet for another list of pot handles. When he got up and he began to present his paper, and he was obviously moved himself as he did, and so was I before he finished, because he was giving evidence of what they have found recently, having dug up the bodies of those who had been crucified at the actual time of Jesus. And the stereotype was broken, because it wasn't like the pictures tell, or like the songs say, on a lonely hill. In the first place, the crucifixion did not take place on a lonely hill. It took place at a crossroads where thousands of people would pass by and see, because the Romans used crucifixion as a deterrent from crime, and they wanted everyone to see how Rome treated its criminals. In the second place, the uh, victims were not crucified with any cloth gracefully covering them, like the pictures, they were crucified stark naked. And the procedure was to place the victim, first of all, sideways against the cross. And then they drove a spike through both heels, just in front of the Achilles tendon. And then after they had fastened them securely sideways, then they twisted their arms around this way and nailed them through the wrists. And uh, if you try standing like that for a little bit, pretty soon your muscles begin to retch. And uh, as if that was not enough, some poor sadist came along and drove a spike through their private parts as well. And there they hung at the crossroads. Well, thousands of people walked by and saw it. And when I began to visualize that picture of Jesus, the Creator, the one who was keeping the hearts beating in the chests of those who were doing their evil work. I was strangely silent and solemn, and I began to think about it. There was a lot of pain, there was a lot of gore, there was a lot of blood. But when Jesus died, he didn't cry out for pain. He didn't sob because of the nails or the hurt. He said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Apparently there were bigger issues at stake at the cross than just the nails and the blood and the gore although there was plenty of that. Big issues. Sometimes we hear the sentimental cross sung about today. I have listened for two hours in my car driving along in a religious station, perhaps. I've listened to song after song after song with the religious crooners and even the torch singers singing sentimental songs about the cross. 
And after a while, you begin to say, let's have some substance to it. What was it that was at stake here at this cross? I would like to invite you to turn to a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, where it tells us something that is very significant, and I find it even more significant in today's English version, better known by some as the Good News Bible, which is a very good translation, by the way. The scholars give it good marks. And it makes some points clear in this passage that otherwise are a little hard to understand. Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 4, But he, that is Jesus, endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered. We are made whole by the blows he received. Um, I like the way that communicates so well that you'll forgive me for reading it again. Jesus endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne, all the while, we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered. We are made whole by the blows that he received. The song that we had just before says it well. It was I. Now, the idea that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, is very scriptural. It's just as scriptural as your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, of course, is a classic chapter on it, the first few verses, where it says it in so many words, Christ died for our sins. Hebrews 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Revelation 1, verse 5, just so that we take a look at a few of the classics on the point. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 14, is another classic statement on the subject. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus came because we needed a Savior. Romans 8, verse 3, another one. God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in sinful man. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8, yet another. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Hebrews 2, verse 9, is an interesting text on the subject. Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, for everyone. Galatians, the first chapter, verse 4. 
Paul begins by his salutation, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, who gave himself for our sins. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 7. We could go on and on. Maybe you think we're never going to stop. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Well, now that may jog your memory. Christ, our Passover lamb. What is that referring to? You recall, it's back in Egypt, the night before Israel left for the promised land. The plagues of Egypt have come and gone, all except one. And that night, the instruction was given to the people of Israel. Take a lamb, kill the lamb, sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and overhead. And when the death angel passes through the land of Egypt, when he sees the blood, he will pass over and stay in your house. Don't go out of your house until the morning. You remember the story? Very real. And it was part of a system that had become quite common, the killing of the lamb representing Jesus who was to come and to die in our place. I like the description that is given by someone who tried to imagine what it would be like to be the firstborn in a family in Israel that night. And uh, you've gone to bed with your sweatshirt and Levi's on because you're going to leave for the promised land right after midnight. But you're having trouble sleeping. <clears throat> so you say, uh, Father, um, have you killed the lamb yet? And Father says, don't worry, go to sleep. But Father, have you killed the lamb? Relax, my child. Uh, it's only ten o'clock. We have plenty of time. Father, I'm the firstborn. I know the instructions. Have you killed the lamb? Yes, we did. Did you sprinkle the blood overhead and on the two side posts? Oh, come on, my child. You know, that's legalistic. Let's not be legalistic about this. <clears throat> Let's not get nitpicking about it. But that was the instruction. Father, you've heard about the death angel that's going to fly over. Have you killed a lamb and sprinkled the blood? Oh, my child, don't take that seriously. God is good and kind. We can trust him. He wouldn't hurt anybody. God wouldn't hurt anybody. You know, there is a theory that's floating around today. That God is so good and kind, he wouldn't hurt anybody. It was the death angel that passed over Egypt that night. The Bible doesn't say it was the devil or his angels. So how do you get this together? There are those today who say that um, that's a pagan idea that Christ had to die. And there are some who go so far as to say that God the Father then, you mean to tell me, is up there and he's looking down and he says, I'm upset and I've lost my temper about this sin problem and I need to see some blood. Give me a pound of flesh. And so they say, that's heathen. That's what the heathen people do. Pestilence breaks out in the city or the village. And the witch doctor says, here's the one. Sacrifice him. Or kill this baby. 
or throw this to the crocodile. That's heathen, trying to appease an angry God. Wait a minute. We've missed something. I do not believe that Jesus loves us and that God is out to see a pound of flesh. I believe that the Bible says it clearly. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. They're both in this business of redemption. It is the Father and the Son at the cross. It isn't the Father losing his temper and saying, I've got to see some blood. It's the Father and the Son together exhibiting something that sometimes we overlook. God has two aspects to his character that are very real. He's a God of justice and he's a God of mercy. Now, I wouldn't want to live in the universe where we did not have a God of justice. Would you? How would you like to live in the city of Lincoln or the state of Nebraska or the United States of America where there was no justice or judicial system? Do you think in the day and age in which we live and the kind of people that we're seeing more and more of that this would be a happy place to live? It's bad enough, as is. And all governments have been faced with this premise. And actually, they're modeled after the government of heaven. Because it was Mayor LaGuardia, one of the great lawmakers and leaders of our past, who said that man has made 10,000 laws, but he has never made one single improvement on the Ten Commandments. No government is any stronger than its laws. And no law is any stronger than the penalty for breaking the law. And no penalty is any stronger than the enforcement of the penalty for breaking the law. That's just a major premise of any government. And without that, you have anarchy reigning. Isn't this true? Let's look at that one more time. No government is any stronger than its laws. No law is any stronger than the, than the penalty for breaking it. And no penalty is any stronger than the enforcement of that penalty for breaking it. That goes true for God's government, for the earthly government, for a city, or for your family. For your family. The parent who goes and shouts up the stairs to the children, this is the last time, I'm going to say this is the last time, has already lost the battle long ago. And any parent who has fallen into the trap of doing nothing but threaten and threaten and threaten and never following through comes to the painful realization sooner or later that he lost a long time ago. And all he's doing is making his child nervous. That's all. Making his child hyper. And no child is happy unless he knows what the rules are and knows that they are enforced. He knows the perimeters and the boundaries. That is basic to any happy family or home. It makes no difference where. I'm thankful that God is a God of justice and that God has laws. Otherwise, we couldn't trust Him living eternally with Him. But I'm also thankful that God is a God of mercy. That's the other side of his character. And when God created centuries ago, he created intelligent beings with the power of choice. And the minute he did that, he entered upon a risky business. Right? Because he entered into the problem that someday someone could and would undoubtedly make the wrong choice. He made provision for that if it should ever come. Before the foundation of the world was laid, he made provision for that with a plan called a plan of redemption, the gospel, salvation. So that anyone who became a victim of a world of sin would, if he accepted God's plan, would have it more than made up to him someday for having been born in the inconvenience of this situation. 
Now, if we in this world simply live our three score years and ten, and the more we see of life, the tireder we get of it. And we have that as the end and the sum and total. Then we are of all people most miserable because God has made provision to make up to us for having been born on this planet. And God has made provision for mercy and salvation in spite of justice. How does he do it? Well, our illustrations are feeble. But one day I was traveling through a backcountry road up in Oregon. I was a pastor of several churches, the old circuit, you know. And I was late to a funeral. And so I was taking a back road and spinning gravel all over the place when suddenly I saw another car behind me spinning gravel all over the place as well. I hadn't expected to see him back there. And the police officer pulled me over. He was upset. And he said to me, Who are you anyway? I thought I had a stolen car here. And I said, I'm a preacher on the way to a funeral. He said, I beg your pardon? I said, I'm late. I'm sorry. And he began to shift from foot to foot. And he said, "Um, I don't know what to do with you. He said, "Uh, if I give you a citation, it will show up in the paper tomorrow and all your parishioners will see it. And I don't think a citation is the answer anyway. And I said, no, I don't either. (laughs) And it continued to shift from foot to foot until finally he said, go on, go on, you're on your own. Go on your way. And as I drove away from that officer, I never had a greater motivation in my life for wanting to obey the law because of his kindness to me. I really wanted to do the right thing. Now, I had another experience one time where an officer stopped me on a freeway early in the morning, dry road, no traffic, five miles over the speed limit. And he had no mercy whatsoever. I tried to reason with him, no way. And all I could say after I got the ticket was, now if you haven't gotten your quota yet for today, Keep following me. I'll be driving the same speed. You can give me another ticket. (laughs) And I was glad I already had my ticket by that time. That didn't inspire me to want to obey at all. Mercy motivates me. But the illustration breaks down. Why? Because If we're going to follow the biblical principle that we've just read from Isaiah, the officer would go to court for me, and he'd pay for me, right? He doesn't just let me go and give me the impression that the law is no good. If he had respect for the law and the traffic, He would take my place. Mercy. Mercy. What is it that demanded the death of Christ for sinners? It was a law that was eternal. And God had the choice of either forgetting about the sin problem and saying it doesn't make any difference and letting the law go down or of continuing to prove that the law is right and providing a substitute. Evangelical Christians believe in a substitute for sinners. Do you believe that? And what does that do? That proves that God's law stands. That it goes on. That justice still reigns. That this universe is safe. That the anarchy will never come. It also proves that God's law could never be changed because once someone dies because of a broken law, it's pretty hard to change it after that. Why would you want to change something when someone has already shed blood for it? One day when I was a kid, I used to sit in the front row and watch some banners drop across the stage. Twenty-four great issues that are settled by the life and death of Jesus. 
And I remembered them. And I dug them out from my file. And I copied down 15 of them. I'd like to read them to you quickly to show you some substance to the cross. Something more than sentimental. Something that involves deep issues. Listen. Number one, the cross proved that God's love for man is great. Number two, it proved that God paid the penalty for sin. Number three, Jesus proved that the law could not be changed or set aside at the cross. Number four, he proved that the penalty for sin was fair and just. Number five, he proved the awfulness of sin. Number six, he purchased the right to destroy the enemy. Number seven, he purchased the right to forgive the sinner and still be just. Number eight, he made grace available to all who believe and trust in him. Number nine, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Number ten, he obtained the keys to the grave, the right to raise the dead. Number eleven, he proved that the wages of sin is death. Number twelve, he made the Sabbath a memorial of creation and redemption. Number thirteen, he vindicated the character of God before the universe. Number fourteen, he proved that God's government would stand forever. And number fifteen, he bought back the lost dominion. These are only a few but these are big issues that are brought to light and settled at the cross. Now, one of the reasons for the cross is because God has an adversary, the devil. And there's a great controversy that's been going on ever since sin began in the universe. And the enemy is constantly shaking his fist at God and saying it's not fair. And God has gone over backwards, if you please, to do everything fair and just in the great conflict that's going on. When Satan sinned and found himself outside of heaven, he was a painful reality of the fact that God is a God of justice. God wasn't going to say, well, just forget it. Satan was on the outside looking in. Then he had a plan. I will go to work and I will get other created beings to sin too. And to fall. And when I do, then this will put God on the spot. If He doesn't have a plan for saving them, then they will be my subjects, and I will have a rival government. But if God does have a plan for letting them go, then he'll have to let me back into heaven. And this mighty Lucifer, with all of his intelligence, figured he had it worked out to an impasse. God was in a corner. He didn't realize that there was a plan that he knew nothing of, already in operation, that Jesus would come and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lucifer fell when there was no one to tempt him. Lucifer fell when there was no one to deceive him. Lucifer fell in the presence of God. That's serious business. Mankind fell in the presence of the tempter and the deceiver. It's serious business, but Jesus came to give us hope. Aren't you thankful for that? And he died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was in China during the Boxer Rebellion. The bandits took the Christian missionary off into their hideout. And they said, will you give up your faith? He said, no, I can't. And they cut off his toes and they cut off his fingers. Now will you give up your faith? No, I can't. And they cut off his hands and they cut off his feet. Now will you give up your faith? No. And they cut off his legs at the knees and his arms at the elbows. 
And as he was dying in his own blood, I said, do you have any last words to say? He said, yes. <clears throat> Tell my son to come take my place in China. I see a lonely cross on a public hill. A lonely cross on a public hill. And they've driven the nails. And they've pushed the thorns in. And they wagged their heads. And they shot out their tongues. And they made fun. And they said he saved others himself he cannot save. Why don't you come down from the cross? Do you have any last words to say? And he did. And he said to them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the other last words? Yes. Tell my sons, my daughters, to come take my place in heaven. But best of all, he'll be there too because of the resurrection. What a story. What a story. I believe that God went through torture and pain at the cross with his son. I reject the idea of God demanding some blood and a pound of flesh. I believe that the Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And that it was the law that insisted that the wages of sin be paid. And that God has made ample provision for all of us. Now, of course, you would expect the song for us to sing as we conclude tonight. Wouldn't you? It's one of the oldest, but it's still one of the best. And it's still one of the top five favorites. Which is it? Let's sing it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand best for the world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to Someday for a crown. John Wesley preached for years. Including the Indians in Georgia. You heard about him just the other night. On the way back from Georgia to England, he said, what? I went to America to save the Indians. But who was going to save John Wesley? And he continued to preach and to live a holy life until one day, after preaching for years, his heart was strangely warmed on Aldersgate Street when he heard the preface to Luther on Romans from the Moravians. It is possible to be in the Christian church for years and years and still never had your heart warmed to the realization that Christ died for me, even me, for me. And if you come to that realization tonight for the first time, if there's someone who has come to that realization for the first time, I don't care who you are, what your background, where you're from. 
We'd like to talk to you about it. In fact, I have a personal burden, a passion for backsliders. I hope there are some backsliders coming to these meetings. I really do. I have good news for you. And I wish you'd identify, pull our coattail, talk to us at the door, let us know who you are, anyone who hears the call of God, perhaps for the first time or again after a period of discouragement. Please let us know. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we hear again from your word the good news that Christ died for our sins, even ours. Even mine, as though I'm the only one in the world and everyone here. We pray that you will help that to go deep down into our hearts, save it from becoming an old saying. And uh, may we go out of here this evening with the realization that we stand before heaven as though we had never, ever even sinned because of Jesus. We praise you for your mercy and your forgiveness. We thank you for your justice. And we're thankful that the universe forever will be saved. We respond in love and gratitude tonight. Be with each one who looks to you. For Jesus' sake. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.